In episode 77, we welcome Nicholas Morgan onto the podcast to talk about his new book, Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey, but are too afraid to ask. Indeed, and we'll be chatting to Nicholas about the book, his career, and some of his views on the current state of the world of whiskey. As always, you can find some more whiskey-based content, images and videos with some terrible hair continuity errors, etc. on our social media platforms, at Whiskey and Things Podcast on Instagram, and at Whiskey and Things on Facebook and Twitter. And don't forget to give us a review on your favourite podcast platform as well. That's very, very helpful, as all podcasters will tell you. You're listening to Whiskey and Things with Nick Kent and Dave Giles. Welcome to episode 77. I'm Dave Giles. And I'm Nick Kent. This is the Whiskey and Things podcast. It certainly is. And as a result, we're not going to drink any whiskey today. Yeah, we're having a week <laughs> off. I've yeah, got a nice I, pint it, of iced water. It's very mate, nice. I, I do feel like I've drunk a bit too much whiskey recently. Yeah, I just didn't feel like it today. We, you know, <laughs> yeah. we've got we've, a great guest, and we could have had a jam, but it's in the middle yeah. of the day. It's like three o'clock. That's wanted yeah. some water in the chat. But yeah, we've had a lot of whiskey recently. I think we've tried anywhere up. I think it may have been twenty whiskey in the last two weeks. You reckon? Might, possibly oh, more than that. Oh God, yeah. Yes, you're right. Taste buds have certainly got been overloaded. And this wasn't in one night, people. We uh, we went to Cotswolds Distillery last week, so that episode will be coming up soon. But yes, we tried a few whiskeys there, you know, as you can expect. And then we uh, did our blending set, and then we, we did, did the four New Zealand whiskeys on another day. And yes, then and we finished we the had Westland. The, we had the three three whiskey baron whiskies of course that was last week's episode yes <laughs> it's been loads it's been absolutely loads yeah i just need a little bit of a reset nick yes a little bit of a reset well today's so, uh, episode is perfect because we're going to talk about literature dave <laughs> yes literature yes how Fantastic. high this <laughs> <laughs> yes. superb superb this, yeah this week I'll we you, welcome oh. let me tell you something nick let me oh, let me oh. you know oh on the nose Oh, new book smell. This book smells delightful. <laughs> oh, oh, I love that smell. And that on is the a eyes, great smell. It's, it's got a few different colours, actually, which are, are all very, very tastefully put together. It's very technicolour. Oh, it's lovely. It's Ooh, lovely. All the shades. Yes. Uh, yes I love we new are, book smell. Oh, me too. Me yes. too. Just my favourite things is opening a book. Uh, I love old yeah. book smell as well. Leather book smell. Old books. Give me an old book. Let me go into an old book sh- bookshop. Oh, musty, then... musty oh, smell. The dust. The dust. Ooh. Ooh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Give me an dust. old first edition any day, mate. <laughs> oh, by oh, yeah. a fire, sitting there. Oh, yes. Now we're talking. That's that's <laughs> that's real life. That is. Wow. So uh, yeah, shall we, shall no, we crack on? Oh, do, do you want to do you want to quickly introduce who we've got on? Well, yeah, we might be an idea. Um, this week we welcome Nicholas Morgan, writer. Strategic thinker, scholar, and skeptic. That's from his LinkedIn page. Nice. Um, yeah. He's coming on today to talk about his new book, Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey, but are too afraid to ask. Um, we had Billy Abbott on a few weeks ago talking about this, back in episode 65 in June. And uh, now, now Nick's here to talk about it. It's been released um, at the moment exclusively through the Whiskey Exchange, but uh, later on it'll be out in other shops as well. But we just had a chat with him, and he was a lovely, lovely man, and uh, spent a bit of time with us, which we're very um, appreciative of, weren't we, Dave? Yes, especially seeing as he's currently on Isla and could be doing yeah. much more fun things than talking to you and I. Absolutely. Absolutely. Roll the tape. <laughs> okay, well, there we go. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Nicholas Morgan. Doctor. Nicholas Morgan. Welcome to Whiskey and Things. How are you? I'm very well. I'm sitting here looking out at the bright sunshine um, falling all over Isla today. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> Jealous. <laughs> you mentioned in the emails before we came on that uh, there was a nice field of barley next to where you're staying. Was that there? Or did Brook Laddie nick it? Uh, no, the, bar, the <laughs> barley's almost in, I think. Um, they're, they're taking in the straw bales and stuff now. So I think there was a combine harvester in a couple of fields beyond me um, yesterday, but I think it's mostly all in, and the weather's been so great for the for the farmers. It's absolutely fantastic. Awesome. We haven't made it to Isla yet. 
this like this this wonderland we're hoping to make make it too soon <laughs> well, well make, make sure to be honest don't make the mistake of coming over to isla for the festival because it's so busy i mean it's great yeah but it's not really what i just like so you need yeah. to come a bit uh, off that season to get a real experience not just of the whiskey side of the island but but the whole place you know I've got this view in my head now. It's like it's, it's, it's lovely land. I'm th- it's like almost like Toontown in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You know, <laughs> when you go through the through the tunnel, and it's like this amazing thing. That's and it's probably just going to be a wet field. But you know, to us, it's going to be this amazing thing. Anyway, don't diss those wet fields, Nick. I love a wet field. I've had some of my happiest moments in the wet field, Dave. <laughs> I know, I know. But uh, yes, anyway, we're here to talk. To, or you're here to talk about your new book today. Everything you need to know about whiskey. Brackets, but are too afraid to ask. Mm-hmm. Before we get on to that, would you give our listeners just a brief version of your whiskey origin story, please? Sure. Well, I'm a historian by training. So I have a PhD actually in 17th century religious history. Wow. And in the way that you do um, trying to find jobs um, in universities, I ended up in the University of Glasgow first researching for a project on 19th and 20th century business people, and then um, lecturing in Scottish history, which I did for about five or six years, um, until I was asked one day to go and um, talk to some people in London at a company called United Distillers, which had just been formed as a result of the merger between Guinness and the Distillers Company in 1986-87. And United Distillers wanted to set up an archive so I was asked to go and speak to them about that job and was offered it. That was back in 1990. And uh, by that time, I sort of knew a little bit about whiskey. And I had friends who'd mentored me into single malts. I'd actually spent time already, a lot of time traveling around Scotland and here on Isla and places. So I had that sort of background. But I think coming into the industry as I did was, uh, was quite a thing because certainly in, in this position of archivist, which no one quite understood what it meant, including me, because I'm a historian, which is very different from being an archivist. Right. Um, it gave me a great sort of ability to get an overview of the industry and sort of go in anywhere and talk to any people, certainly within what was then UD, which is now Diageo, which is just the biggest Scotch company in the world, you know? Mm. So I was archivist for a few years and then made a sort of sharp left turn down to London and got a marketing role. And when Diageo was formed, which is 1997, so 10 years after you know, the merger with Guinness, I managed to land the job of global marketing director for single malt whiskey, which, which may actually demonstrate what lack of interest the company had in single malts <laughs> at that time that they would give the job to someone like me who knew really nothing about marketing. Right. But... Um, I was landed with the world's largest portfolio of single malts on my lap, which was the most delightful thing to do. We did a lot of work on brands like Talisker and Lagavulin got those going, introduced new brands, well, new to the world as brands, Klein Leash, Singleton, all of that stuff. And um, in the early 2000s, special releases, which, you know, Port Ellen and Brewer and I think to an extent transformed the whole market for collectible whiskies and certainly blew the secondary market for whiskies, for better or worse, it has to be said, <laughs> um, wide open. Right. I was in that role for about 12, 12 years and then moved over to something called Head of Whiskey Outreach, which I was still doing stuff on malts, but I was also doing a lot of communication work. And then I'd been angling for years to write the history of Johnny Walker for their bicentenary. Hmm. And uh, eventually, I, I would say, to be honest, perhaps a year or two years too late as far as concerned, <laughs> Um, they said, okay, you can do this, Nick. It's sort of a, a, a swan song project or legacy project, whatever you want to call it. So we started working on that in 2017 and the book was published last year. And I left the Agio in December and I'm now writing. I've written a new book uh, very quickly after the Johnny Walker book. And I'm doing columns for Master of Malt, Daily Beast and some consultancy work as well, you know. Right. Now you're on Isla. What are you doing in Isla? Is it just to meet old friends or just or keep up with what's going on on the inside? So, so I'm, I'm partly on Isla because I think you'll discover once you start coming here that you just have to keep on coming back because it's a very special place. And um, to, to me, I mean, people probably see it in a different way. It has a, a calmness about it and it's just a place to be for a few days. Um, 
Also, it's an ability, an opportunity to meet up with some some good, very good, long-standing friends, former colleagues. Some of them just other friends I have on the island. Um, it's a place to get a bit of gossip, you know. Which yeah, is always, I imagine. <laughs> always good to hear what's going on. And uh, it's part of a road trip. So I'm off to Argyle for three or four days. Then I'm up to Speyside. Then I'm back down to Edinburgh. And then at some point, I'm not quite sure when I'll end up back in London. Right. So um, obviously, you started out as a historian in religious studies and ended up in whiskey, do you consider whiskey to be a kind of religion? Well, I think some people do, um, <laughs> you, you know, and actually in the new book, there's a whole chapter on, um, I think it's called whiskey experts in which mm. I explore the level of enthusiasm that, uh, that some people show for it. I mean, it's an odd, it's, it, you know, it's an odd thing because I think for, for people like me, when you work in the industry, there's no doubt about it. You get whiskey in your blood. And then it's, I've seen people coming in and out of, of the Scotch business, and some are really smart, really clever marketing people. They come in, they do a great job for three or four years, then they move on to something else. Other people, they come in, and it's like Mr. Toad, you know, being knocked over by a car. They're just staring at this thing going, poop, poop. Yeah, that's, that's what I want. And they, they stick around. So, so there's, a, there's a stickiness about whiskey, um, and there's a passion for it and a passion for places and people, you know. Um, and then there's there's a stage that goes beyond that, I think, to um, sometimes what one might describe as uninformed zealotry. Uh, <laughs> right. And there's quite, there's quite a lot of that about. And um, one of the things I do in the book is try and have a few knocks at that and get people to think a bit more level-headedly about, about Scotch and their relationship with it, you know. Yeah, I think that it's chapter six you're talking about, yeah, the whiskey experts bit. That was a chapter I was uh, looking forward to and dreading a little bit. Um, obviously doing a podcast and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people, especially with like social media and stuff, there's a lot of people out there not pretending to be experts, but uh, I don't know, some people might see them as that, you know, and believe in them. So is it is there too much of that going on, you know, in the social media world? Well, I think there's too much of that going on in general in social media. It's not, it's not <laughs> just the preserve of whiskey, you know, it's the whole the whole nature of the beast, isn't it? And you know, what I what I, what I say in the book is that you know, you need to try and find trusted sources. Um and and personally, although I think I am described as an expert in the book, which and it's the word that I hate the most because all I've done over 30 years is find out about whiskey and I'm still finding out. So my expertise is somewhere in the future, you know? Yeah. Um, find trusted sources, talk to people, decide who you, who, who you trust. If they call themselves an expert, they're probably not. In fact, <laughs> almost, I would say definitely not. And, but just learn and listen and, in, and enjoy, you know, um, it doesn't have to be sort of almost as painful as, as, religious you know some religious faith or belief it, it is ultimately about having fun yeah fun with the drink fun with the places and fun with your friends who also enjoy it whiskey so how did this book come about then it's with partnership with the whiskey exchange so did they uh, come to you and ask you to do it or was it your idea yeah so I, so i think i think the actual process as i understand it nick was that um ebury who the publishers went to the whiskey exchange with the idea uh, the Whiskey Exchange really liked it, and um, they were very kind enough to give me a call, and I went and spoke with Sukinda about the book. Then I went and spoke to the publishers. Then I wrote um, a sort of very short, not even a proposal. In fact, I think it's it's more or less the paragraph that's on the back of the book right. was what I wrote to them and said, well, this is sort of what the book would be about, and they, they seemed to like that a lot. And then we uh, started working on it. But at the time, I was still sort of doing stuff on the Johnny Walker book. I was still in Diageo. Right. I was only at the, at the end of my time with Diageo. I was working about three days a week. So the other days I was working with with this project. But it really got didn't really get started until, well, January, to be honest. So I wrote it pretty quickly. Um, right. So Kinder Singh actually wrote, in, he wrote the introduction to the book. Hmm. And he said uh, its aim was to stimulate debate. It's been out a few weeks now. Has it had that desired effect, do you think? Well, well, no one's knocking on my door quite at the moment. Um, <laughs> I mean, at the moment, it's only available through Whiskey Exchange. And although I think they've had a really good response to it, clearly, when it goes out into the stores, which is um, middle of September, then a lot more people will see it. And I think, or I hope there'll be a lot more discussion about it. Um, I know that some of the people that have read it have said, well, it's a great book, but I really don't agree with it x or y or z right. so um that's fine because that's i think 
there's nothing to say in the book that I'm right about some of the things. It's just that I think opinions should be expressed mm. and, and diverse opinions should be expressed. So whereas some people will have one view on a subject, uh, which might, for example, be Tewa, because that's sort of one of the apparently controversial ones, I'm pretty well known for having other views on the subject. And I think they should both both be heard and discussed, you know? Yeah. That's what I liked about it, actually. Look, at the end of most of the paragraphs, you have um, whiskey writers and experts kind of giving their opinions on things. Mm. Um, was there any opinions which surprised you from those people? Yeah, well, I, f- I felt it was important and um, made this clear to Sukinda when, and, and the publishers that if it was just me, then it'd be a bit boring. And mm. um, it would be interesting to try and get opinions. So I, I'm lucky that I've got a community of friends that I've known for years around the world who are involved in whiskey, and we got those people um, to answer some pretty um, mundane questions, actually. I, I, I <laughs> don't think I did them great justice. And actually, I think the surprise was the amount of consensus on uh, topics which I would thought might be um, might, might cause some sort of uh, disparate views. I mean, some of them were easy. It's like most important person in whiskey. Well, everyone's going to say Michael Jackson. Um, best writers, everyone's going to say Charlie McLean and Dave Broom. Right. But, you know, when we got onto stuff, I was asking people stuff about cask finishes and things like that. And I was pleased, actually, that there was, for example, on that subject, a very healthy degree of skepticism, um, a very strong degree of skepticism, in fact, on how far cask finishing got. The fact that many of these cask finishes, frankly, aren't that great and are probably being done just to cover up whiskey that's really not fit to be on the market or not old enough <laughs> to be on the market. So I suppose the surprise was was that these people were prepared to say it to me, but they're often not prepared to say it to <laughs> themselves. You know? um, the best comment, or two, two of the best comments, want the first um, to the question of, well, who's the most important person in the whiskey industry? Is Richard Woodard, who you may or may not know. Richard is an independent freelance writer, and he's a great thinker as well. And his answer was just so smart. He just said, the consumer, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's everyone else was going on about Charlie and Michael and whatnot. A very pointed and a very sensible answer. And then amongst all the di- very divergent views about what's your favorite glass, I mean, that has to be the most stupid question, but it really, <laughs> really, really fired people up as I knew it would. Um, it was Dave Broom's answer, which was uh, for drinking any glass that you've got, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. But I hope they bring a bit of a bit of colour and just just uh, modulate my my droning voice, you know, as it runs <laughs> through the book all the time. No, I enjoyed those parts, and in fact, the whole last chapter is about the people in whiskey, which is a really. In fact, I think the whole book's about the people in whiskey. You know, it's of course the drink, but the people who made it really what it is. You know, in the time I've been in the industry. I've just met some absolutely remarkable people, you know, and and it has to be said, you don't always get on with them that well, but you have to respect what they've done and what they've contributed to the industry. And they're not always well known. So it seems quite odd to me. We, we know all this stuff about the great figures of the past, you know, the so-called whiskey barons that everyone goes on about all the time. But it's almost as if nothing happened after about 1920 or 1930. And certainly today, we don't hear that much about people in the industry. We hear a lot about people with loud voices on social media, you know, but we don't actually hear about the doers and the people that have, that have made great things happen. And Sikindra and I were very clear that we wanted to celebrate these people and give them the sort of recognition they deserve. So, for example, it's, there's a lot in the book about um, Jack and Wallace Milroy, who, um, you know, the famous eponymous shop in Soho, And their contribution, I mean, everyone talks about single malts and they talk about William Grant started the category. Well, there's a lot of truth about the importance of William Grant and Glenn Fiddick, and I write about that as well. But people like Jack and Wallace and, of course, uh, Gordon McPhail, so the retail side was just as important in bringing this new world of single malt to consumers in the late 60s and 70s. So they, they, they all get a good run for their money. Um, and I talk about some of the journalists and writers who seem to have been forgotten, um, which I found a really interesting uh, uh, side of things. And, and also um, also some of the great, great blenders, you know, um, Richard Patterson and my former colleague, Jim Beveridge at Diageo and so on. But it's really just trying to get 
some of these names out and uh, and and give people a better understanding. I think of, of some of the some of the rather unique personalities in the in the industry as well. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about like whiskey personalities, you mentioned in the book how some say distillers became almost their brand ambassadors, even before Jim McEwen you know, that kind of thing. Do you think that's going to become more of a thing now with social media, et cetera, as people become more accessible, you know, becoming a face of their, their own brands, as it were? Well, you know, you need, you need, you need a face. You have an, an increasingly, you need a face and you need a person. And I think it's quite interesting. My experience in Diageo is that large companies are a little uneasy about faces and people. They don't, they don't necessarily like people sort of putting their heads up over the parapets and becoming famous in their own right. Um, so large companies really tend to have more brand ambassadors and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, but for smaller businesses, you know, you can focus everything on the whiskey maker. And actually, in a sense, one of the first people to do this, not distiller, was John Glaser when he set up Compass Box, because it was all about John as the whiskey maker, you know, oh, wow. modeled sort of really on a winemaker um, typology, you know, but very effective, strong communication, all about an individual with passion, wanting to, you know, wanting to make a difference in what they're making. And you certainly see that model now with uh, many of the new distilleries, even if, as I do explain in the book, they're mostly owned by pretty big, treacherous investors. And, uh, you know, they've got really smart, sharp marketing people behind them. But you don't see those people. Yeah. You see the nice person at the front with, um, <laughs> if I may say so, the tattoos and piercings and all of that stuff, <laughs> you know, being very groovy and hip and making their whiskey in the way that they've always wanted to. I mean, it's, it's another marketing thing, but you can't have products without people. Yeah. In the same way for whiskey, you can't have products without places. You know, those two things really defines so much about what it is that, that, that people like to consume, you know. We've, we've heard from a number of, of people we've interviewed over the, over the last year and a bit um, that people have suggested that we're in a kind of golden age of whiskey. Do you feel that that's the case? Uh, do you feel like the industry is in good shape or are you concerned that there, there perhaps are people in it for the wrong reasons and potentially it's, it's barking up the wrong tree? Well, so broadly speaking... I would say that whiskey at the moment, Scotch whiskey in particular, but all whiskey is having the time of its life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is. And when I joined United Distillers in 1990, I mean, that was only seven years after the 83 closures, you know, Brora, Port Ellen, Glenary Royal, all these places with just within the DCL, or just within recent memory were closed. I was lucky to spend a lot of time in Louisville in the very early 1990s, just after I joined. And I mean, Louisville was, was like cobwebs and, you know, rolling, whatever those things are that roll through towns that are deserted. Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed, yeah. I mean, you know, bourbon, no one was interested. Absolutely no one was interested. And if you told people, if you tried to tell people in 1990, describe, you know, what the world of whiskey was going to look like in 2021, no one would have believed you. No one would have believed you. So where we are now is absolutely tremendous. You know, it's so vital. It's so vibrant. And importantly, it's bringing newer people into the orbit of, of scotch and bourbon and Japanese whiskey, whatever, whatever it might be. And people like yourselves, guys, you know, coming and talking about it. And, and in the course of that, you're bringing new people in. And so expanding the whole sort of franchise um, of whiskey and, you know, the one thing I did, or one of the few things I did uh, learn in, as people tried to knock my head around teaching me marketing stuff um, was, you know, you have to continually recruit new people into your category, whatever that might be, whether it's trainers or, you know, cl other clothing brands, music brands um, or, or, or drinks, you know, because without, without new people, without new interests, categories die away. And that was sort of what was happening in 1990 to some extent. Uh, and now that's been turned on its head, not just with single malts, but with, with, with blends as well. So I, I absolutely, uh, you know, congratulate the industry on what it's done and congratulate all the people involved in it um, who've, who've brought it to the state that it is now. However, that is not to say I think that everything's great and, great and rosy. 
um, because I think there is a danger that whiskey is sort of losing its soul a bit, Scotch whiskey in particular. And, you know, these multiplicity of very highly priced um, single malt limited bottlings where, you know, between the 50 pounds or whatever you might pay for a 16-year-old Lagavulin and then 50,000 pounds for something that's three years, well, where's, where's the quality Where's the quality ratio going on there? Can someone explain that one to me necessarily? You know, there, there, there's, there's, there's a bit of greed around, I think, and that never, that never looks good, and it can leave a sour taste in people's minds. It can make people think they're being left behind. You know, I thought scotch was for me, but it isn't because I can't afford the £50,000 bottle. I can only afford the £50 <laughs> bottle. So I think there's a real danger that that... You might prefer um, the £50 bottle. Well, I was just going to come on to that, Nick, because the fact of the matter is the two mm. dangers. One is that people just feel a bit pissed off about it. The second thing is that people forget just how great these whiskies are that you can buy in your local off-license um, or in many instances now in your local supermarkets. I'm going to talk about the brands I know. I mean, Talisker 10-year-old, Kleinish 14, Kalila 12. These are absolutely brilliant whiskies. Yeah, and they're made so well. They're looked after so well. And, and of course, um, Glen Lyric, Glen Fiddick, um, Highland Park, you know, um, hang on, Lefroig, Ardbeg, Brooklady, Beaumont, just all around the corner here. These are great whiskies in their standard bottlings. And, and I sometimes think that the marketing people sort of lose a bit of sight of that because they're all chasing after the, the high price stuff. And I think that's to be regretted so that's the downside i think but but the upside is so strong you know it really is yes so, so what you're saying is we need to inc- recruit more people into the congregation of the religion uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh but not lose the sole focus uh of the service of the mass right well, i think it's bringing, <laughs> it's bringing people into the body of the church it's, yes. not, it's not losing your soul you know? <laughs> it's not losing your soul to the devil that's the problem yeah i yeah. like that I like that a lot. You're listening to Whiskey and Things. Um, There's so many great stories in this book. How much of the content was already in your head or like in your notes and how much of it was brand new information you went and sought out? So so that's that's a really good question, actually. So a lot of the things um, that I write about, I've been thinking about for quite a long time and writing the Johnny Walker book, sort of brought into a bit more focus and there was a lot of stuff. I mean, the Johnny Walker book, although it's a brand history is actually quite diverse because it does talk a lot about the development of Scotch as a whole and blended Scotch, obviously in, in particular, but there was a lot of stuff that I would have liked to have write written about in that book, which there just wasn't room for. And I was way over my word count when I submitted the manuscript anyway, as I was for this one, in fact, as well. Yeah, that's my next question, actually. Like, was it refreshing to be, be able to just talk about all whiskey and not just centralise on one brand? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in fact, it was interesting. When I did the Johnny Walker book, the lawyers were very concerned about mentioning other brands and stuff like this, um, which I thought meant a bit of colour got lost from the Johnny Walker book. And I was really pleased to be able to write about other brands, which I admire a lot, even if I haven't worked on them um, in in this book. So, so I had sort of ideas, I had some material, and I certainly had, because I didn't have time to do a lot of new research, but I knew exactly what I wanted to go and find. And even in lockdown, there's sort of so much available online just now that I could find most of the stuff I needed just to flesh out some of these bits. Yeah. One of my favorite ones was uh, Irving's Journey, the Sausage Factory Story. Well, now the Sausage Factory Story, <laughs> I am indebted to a lady called Monique Houston. Um, from the United States for that, because I was talking to um, a group of people, some of whom I know quite well in the States, on a Zoom, on these lockdown Zoom chats. And I think I was talking about um, this, which I discussed it in, in the book, the sort of science versus tradition in, in whiskey making, you know. And I think I was talking about the man at Klein Lee. She says, well, it's always about when it smells, it's got all this equipment in front of him and say, when do you make the courtesy of it smells of pineapple? You know, which yeah. is just one of the best answers I've ever had. And I talked about Klein Lee's and the waxy story as well, which 
I'm not going to talk about that. You'll have to buy the book if you want to read that one. It's a great story. Absolutely. And Monique said, well, you need to know about the sausage story. And I was, I was literally at, almost at the end of the chapter about whiskey making. And I said, sausage story. <laughs> so she told me the sausage story. And I said, that is just, that's going in the book. That's fantastic. And so at one o'clock that morning, whenever it was we'd finished this call, I was, I was finding podcasts and articles about, about the sausage story. And uh, and slipped it slipped it in at the end of the chapter, but it's a great <laughs> story. In and I think sausage. <laughs> people listening to this may be wondering, you know, WTF? What what has sausage <laughs> got to do with um, with whiskey? But you'll you'll understand if you go and read it. It is a lovely story. It really is, and it just shows that science still goes hand in hand with that other thing about making making great things. You know, yes, chance and the people who are around it. You know, yeah, yeah. trying duplicate things with you know equipment and technique but it's all down to the people running it yeah. it's a great story yeah. everyone the sausage story, sausage uh, story. <laughs> irving's journey it's a great name for a band that irving's yeah journey. so uh one of our we've, we've got a patreon page where people are very kindly support us out and one of our patrons lauren Heard, heard that we were talking to someone who just ran a book called Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey, but we're too afraid to ask. And uh, she, she has got this question, which she was too afraid to ask, or has been too afraid <laughs> to ask herself. So uh, she said, as a female whiskey drinker, what do you suggest I say to men who try and tell me how to drink my whiskey? Oh, God. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll step back from that just for, for, for a moment and say that one of the things that anyone can observe um, in the world of whiskey and in the social media world of whiskey, but also if you get into whiskey festivals and stuff, and particularly West whiskey festivals after about three o'clock in the afternoon, I note, uh, is that they are full of shouty men, <laughs> you know, and shouty men all over the place who want to tell everyone um, what they know and what they think and the best way to do this and the best glass to drink out of and so on and so forth. Um, and it seems that in a world where there are so many shouty men, they have to shout at women because there aren't that many shouty women, you know. So I think um, some of the experiences that people, some people I know very well, and in fact have witnessed some of their some of the experiences they've written about in the past um, at whiskey festivals and whiskey shows are just appalling. And I don't know why some men can't have it in them just to accept that people are people, and if they want to drink and enjoy a drink, they should do it. You know, just however they like, Absolutely. however they like. And I think some of the things, you know, that have been said to people are uh, women are absolutely despicable, really. And uh, the sooner that's knocked out of the whiskey industry and the whiskey world, because it's not really the whiskey industry, it's the, the world outside of whiskey, male whiskey consumers, um, I think the better. Is that change beginning to happen? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's beginning to happen in a number of ways. So... In the world of making whiskey, uh, women are so much more involved in senior positions now. You know, I mean, when I was in Diageo, we ha have had women distillery managers going way back into the late 90s. In, in fact, in Diageo, it's come on a garden. And I know everyone used to get fed up when we were asked about women in whiskey because it's like, well, it's not a thing for us. You know, mm, we, yeah. it's just not a thing anymore. Of course, the blending team in Diageo is... Um, very strongly peopled by women and has Maureen Robinson's veteran 40 years or more. Sorry, Maureen, I know I'm not supposed to say that. But 40 <laughs> years or more blending, blending whiskey, you know, and not just blending blends, but blending single malts for bottling as well. Rachel Barry, you know, there's just people all over the industry now. And I think that the more that that happens, and it's just going to keep on happening, um, the more that will be sort of a normality, which these people who say, I'm going to tell you how to drink your whiskey or what do you mean you drink whiskey? You're a woman, you know, all that stuff. The more yeah. I think that will just disappear, you know, because it just, not only will it not be acceptable, it just won't make sense anymore, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Nick and I did go on a distillery trip and uh, it got me thinking that I don't really know what the, the, the most difficult job is or the most important job within the distillery what do you think the answer to that is? Like, do you think there is one person that really typifies uh, what comes out of a distillery, or do you think it's just a, it is the team effort of all the different components? 
Well, of course, if you went into a distillery, it would depend very much on who you spoke to. <laughs> I mean, if you went to Lagavulin and spoke to Ian MacArthur, he would have no doubt that he was the most important person <laughs> um, there. And he's a sort of warehouseman and looks after filling and stuff like that. You know, you need, you need to think about where, where does flavor come from in the whiskey making process, okay? So obviously it comes, a lot of it, particularly on Isla, where I am at the moment, from the malt phenolic content of the malt. So the maltster, before you've even got to a distillery, is a pretty important person. Mm. And I know the guys in the maltings here at Port Ellen very well, and they will tell you without doubt, they are the most important people. In <laughs> okay, And they're very proud of what they do at Port Ellen for almost all the distilleries on Isla. Very, very, very proud. You go into a distillery, you've got a mash man. You've got the person that looks after the fermentation process, which is where the magic of flavor really starts happening, you know? And it's it's not difficult for a fermentation to go wrong. It's not, it's not an easy thing. And then you go into the still house. There's even more magic as these liquids turn into vapors and there's copper and all this weird stuff going on. It comes out at the end of a couple of distillations, and then it goes into a cask, all right? And most people will tell you that 60, 70, some people say 80 um, percent of the character of the whiskey that we drink comes from the cask. And the cask is made from Coopers, who are big, burly men who are very, very passionate about what they do. And if you go to a Cooperage, they will tell you in rather a fierce manner that they are the most important people <laughs> in making making whiskey. And actually in the book, I sort of come down on the side of the Coopers because yeah. a, a, I think coopering is a much underrated craft and it is a craft. Um, I mean, there's still, we use machine tools. I mean, they use machine tools in cast manufacture for over a hundred years, but it's still at its heart, you know, a craft and well, well thought out and well used wood is what will make the difference between a, maybe not so great whiskey and an absolutely fantastic whiskey. Yeah? What excites you the most in the whiskey world at the moment that's coming up or that you think might be coming up? What excites me most? Well, I think personally, what excites me most is that after 30 years of working with fantastic single malts and blends at Diageo, I'm going to have more time to being exposed to other people's whiskies, mm. which although... Um, as, as, as many people know, I've been sort of perennially sniffy and rude about. I do, um, with my Diageo hat on, I do realise there are some absolutely great whiskies out there, some of which I don't really know particularly well. So um, so one of the things for me, I think, is is uh, increasing my, my own sort of portfolio and, of knowledge and palate. And then I think the other thing will be seeing the whiskies from so many of these new distilleries properly come of age, by which I don't mean being sold at three years in 50 CL bottles for £65, which is a rather odd thing, if you ask me, but I mean getting up to 8, 10, and 12 years old and really having the opportunity to see what these whiskies are made of and just how good they will be. And I'm sure some of them will be absolutely astonishing, and I'm sure some of them maybe won't be, won't be quite so great. But I think that... <laughs> As that happens, you know, over the next, say, five, six years, that's going to be a really, really important time. And then we'll sort of sort out um, sort out the stayers and maybe the ones that aren't going to stay around for so long. Well, Absolutely. Got any more questions, Dave? I'm, no, uh, I'm I think time. I'm out. This, is, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much. It's, uh, it's, it's great to talk to a whiskey expert. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you can't, you just can't whiskey, get me on that. Whiskey connoisseur, or connoisseur no, I hate connoisseur as well. Um, I know, you, I've never seen the word connoisseur or connoisseurship so many times on one page yeah, as yeah. I did in one of these. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And um, oh, there was a few other words that we used to use, I can't remember what they are. Writing, vid when, when people still made videos back in the 1990s and the, the Oh, the scripts were so corny, you know, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Unique connoisseur, expert. Um, yeah, I could, think we could do without that language, really. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't help, doesn't help at all. Are you against the, the term master blender as well? Or master yeah, blender? I'm not too keen on that. And in fact, I'm having, I'm in, the, in debate with some people at the moment about when master blender and master distiller actually came into common usage. 
because I'd always thought that Master Distiller was invented actually by a former colleague of mine called Mike Collings, who um, who who was a great great whiskey marketing man and really was responsible for the creation of Diageo's classic malts as as, the, as mm. they're known, along with a guy called Roy McMillan. And Mike was very fond that everything had to be master, you know, you can just be a distiller, yeah, be master this, master that, master Cooper, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Um, but, but in fact, it was certainly used earlier than that. I've got a few examples of it being earlier than that. And I've tracked down Master Blender in the UK. In fact, a man called George Thompson, who was at Johnny Walker for years, years and years, started working at Cardu, you know, just as a labourer and ended up production director for Johnny Walker, remarkable man. He was described as master blender in the 1960s, I think. And Lord Calvert, which is a Canadian whiskey, had a big advertising campaign back in the 60s talking about their master blender. So these phrases have been around, but now, you know, you've been in a job for six months and suddenly you're a master this and master that. Yeah. And I don't, I think that's a little... Uh, well, some yeah. people are recognising it. I think Adam Hannett doesn't want to be called master yeah. for a long time. He calls himself the lead distiller, doesn't he? I think, or head distiller. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a title given to people and they just kind of take it, I guess. Sometimes. Well, but you know, I mean, the, the, the sort of origin, you know, goes back to craft apprenticeships and, and people producing a masterpiece. And until you ah. produced your masterpiece, you were not a master craftsman. So I think, that should be the test. And, you know, it goes back to what I just said about people's whiskies maturing and getting up to eight, 10 years. Then maybe we'll see who the master distillers are and who the master distillers aren't, you know? Yeah. I do like, uh, I do like McMira's chief nose officer. I think that's a good title. Yes. <laughs> Angela. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fan of that. But yes. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really, really wonderful. And, uh, and good luck with the book. We hope it, hope it goes very well. Uh, and 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 thank you very much for for sharing some some of your uh, thoughts with us. It's been very it's been wonderful to hear. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you both very much. Now, if I may, I'm going to run out into the Isle of Sunshine while it lasts. Wow, fantastic! Enjoy, enjoy it. Enjoy okay, it. thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Whiskey and Things. You can watch the full uncut video of that chat with Nicholas and on our Patreon page if you are a member. Hey, hey Nick, I got an exclusive here. You don't even know about this. Oh, don't. You don't even. Ah, uh, you know I don't like it when you go off piste. You don't even know about this. You do not know about this, right? So, if you are already signed up to our Patreon page, or if you sign up before the next episode goes live, you have got a chance to win a signed copy of this week's book. Everything you need to know about whiskey but too afraid to ask. I was unaware of that. I told you. I told you. Aren't we good? Aren't That's we great. good. I know. <laughs> you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dave's brought up um, ideas in the past about giving away whiskey, which I was never up for. But yeah, a book. Yeah, fine. You can give away a book. <laughs> I've already read it, so. <laughs> oh, you can keep it. Well, that's what I was thinking. I'd read your your copy because you've fingered for it, and I can just have that. And I've got a lovely, pristine copy of signed edition here, which we can give away. There we go. So there we yes. go. That's what yes. we will do. So this book, everything you need to know about whiskey, but are too afraid to ask, is available now from the Whiskey Exchange for twenty pounds. Um, it, it's exclusive to them at the moment, uh, but it will be available elsewhere from September sixteenth, wherever you want to get it. But uh, yes, we'll be putting a link to the Whiskey Exchange um, affiliate link for us in the description. As well as all of Nicholas's social media stuff, if you want to find out more about Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas, that is, of course. Yes, yes. We're using Nicholas because I'm getting conf- I got confused if I was saying Nick. And there was going to be Nicks all over the place. Yeah, Nick, Nick. Nick, Nick. Yeah. Nick, Nick, Nick. Nick. Uh, Nick, Nick. There we go. Nick. What, what, what? Nick, Nick, Nick. <laughs> Sting me! You're listening to the Whiskey and Things podcast. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for this week. <laughs> The timer that has no end is coming to an end. Uh, that was fun. And it's the middle of the day and I haven't had a whiskey, which is a good thing once yeah. in a while. <laughs> yeah. And also, I just really enjoyed no. what he talked about, actually. I thought it was really interesting. Mm. He's, been around, he's been around the industry long enough and I love his scepticism about it, certain things, but also the positivity he brings as well. I think, I think there's, he's got a nice balance of understanding and 
dare I say, expertise. Oh, 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 I, I don't know. I don't know. Can you? I don't know. Um, yes. Anyway, I, I felt like I learned things that, that last hour, so that was good. Yes, me too. It's made me want to go back and watch the uh, the Man Who Walked Around the World film, because he was a talking head in that. You know, the Johnny Walker documentary, which was on a few, a year or so ago. No. Okay. I told you about it. But, Brilliant. Uh, Put yeah. a link in the description, Nick. Oh, I'll just it. give myself more work. Ah, yes. Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm going to anyway. shut up. Right, let's stop the show before I give myself any more work. Yeah, this happens a- every week. The angels have had their share. <laughs> and I've had mine. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. coming. Whiskey and Things has been brought to you by 